All right, First Timothy for beginners, uh, lesson number seven, elders, deacons, and the church, part two in this section that we're doing. First Timothy chapter three, and we'll pick it up in uh, verse eight in a moment. So in our last lesson we talked about the meaning of the word deacon and how it relates to the work of the uh, church and how this role is different from that of the role of elder, different words for elder, bishop, pastor, all the different words describing the same person. We talked about that. I said that the word deacon is transliterated. It's a transliterated word from the Greek diakonos, which refer to an attendant or a waiter. In the church, it refers to men who are chosen to do certain tasks based on their qualifications and their experience. They serve the church under the direction of the elders. They're different from elders in that their main tasks are service related as opposed to teaching or direction of the, uh, of the assembly. They are selected by the church and we'll take a look at that uh, later on. And they're appointed or ordained if you wish, means they're pretty much the same thing or commended by the elders or the evangelists based on certain qualifications laid out by Paul in Acts chapter six, also Philippians one and 1 Timothy three. So in our lesson today or tonight, we're going to look at these passages that talk about uh, the deacons. There are only three places in the New Testament where deacons are referred to and what we know about their qualifications and work are drawn from these passages. So we're just going to go through these. We're going to pick it up in Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Read this key passage. Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we, we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles and after praying they laid their hands on them. So here the term deacon is not used. Some people say, well, they don't use the term deacon here but the verb describing their work and from which their name would eventually come is used. So the church, the situation is, the church is growing quickly and along with it the responsibility for benevolence. Some feel neglected in the distribution and so a complaint which threatens the unity of the church arises. Not just about food here, but if there's a complaint and an easily divided congregation. You have the Hellenists over here, you have the Hebrews over here, uh, it could easily spiral out of uh, control. So the apostles settle the matter by calling for diakonos, or serving, or waitering, which was not their calling. It wasn't like, oh, that's beneath us, we're too good for that. No, that is, we weren't called to do that. That was not what Jesus uh, gave us to do. Their job, was to teach and to be active in prayer and not to the, uh, the distribution of food. So the apostles establish a kind of a basic criteria for these uh, servants. First of all, they establish a limited number. I don't know why other than seven was a significant number in Jewish numerology. Probably it was based on what they thought the work required. Can you imagine you have to have seven men to manage your benevolence program? That's quite a program. As we had mentioned before, if there were 3,000 that were baptized on the day of, day of Pentecost and the church kept growing and growing, there were probably several hundred uh, widows that needed care. And so to provide daily nourishment for all those people would require quite a few people. Um, they were selected by the congregation from among the congregation. 
Unlike elders that are selected either by the evangelists or the other elders, if we already have elders in place. They were to be men, not women. Uh, Peter specifies the word here, male, and yet there were women who qualified in other areas. You know, there were women in the church, obviously, who were full of the spirit, full of wisdom. It's not a gender thing. And if there was ever a time to establish a precedent, if there ever was a moment to establish the precedent for you know, equal uh, 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 activity of both men and women in the church, this would have been it. They could have said, select among yourselves three men and three women, or four women and three men. You know, they could have said it that way, but they didn't. They, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, they said, select seven men. Um, they were to have charge. That's important. They were to have charge over this task before the apostles did it, but could no longer carry the burden of it. So they gave charge of the task to others. They were in charge. One of the places that we often fail in the modern church. We, don't, we give people a task, but we don't give them the charge for that task. Um, once the guidelines were established, the work was in the hands of these men, not the apostles. And of course, the task was singular. These men were chosen for this task and not to be apostles' assistants at large. I hear that sometimes. The deacons are the assistants of the apostles. And I, I always wondered, could you please give me a scripture that under, you know, to support that, that, that notion. There's no scripture that supports that. The, the elders or the apostles saw that there was an important task that needed to be taken care of. They said to the church, select men, and they give them kind of the, you know, the, the qualifications. The church chooses those men. The uh, apostles approved of the ones that, that were chosen. They blessed them, prayed for them, and gave them charge. They were in charge. The deacons, were the servants of the church. They assisted the church, not the apostles, in carrying out this particular attack. This is why they were chosen among the brethren, by the brethren, because they were going to be the servants of the brethren. Very important. So deacons are not the, quote, assistants of the elders. They are servants of the church. And like the rest of the church, they, they're, they're directed by the, the oversight of the elders, of course, just in the same way as all the members uh, are. They also had um, uh, specific qualifications. Specific qualifications, good reputation, in other words, that, that term speaks for itself, full of the spirit. Well, all Christian men have the Holy Spirit, but some demonstrate more fruit of the spirit as they are growing in Christ. That's what he means by full of the Spirit. Full of wisdom, he says. As deacons, they also needed a particular wisdom or understanding in practical ways. You read in the Old Testament, you know, God filled men with wisdom as artisans and painters and builders when they built the tabernacle. And then when they built the temple, God inspired, if you wish, uh, artisans who would work with metal and, and jewelry and cloth and so on and so forth uh, to, to, to do the very complicated uh, work that, uh, that was assigned to them. So in the same way, God would uh, fill these men with wisdom so that they could do their job. In the New Testament, God gives men gifts and wisdom to carry out the work of the church in various areas, whether that be building or administration or service or giving. The Lord is always involved in the work of the, in the, work of the church. And they were people who could take charge. If you're given charge, you have to be the one who can take charge and get things done. Now, the interesting thing here is, after this passage here, you never hear again any reference to this particular problem. And that tells me that these men took charge. It was okay. They fixed it. They ran with it. It was okay. There were no more, there were no problems anymore. So they, they picked men who could you know, do the job, obviously. Um, they were different kinds of men. The list of deacons includes Stephen, a Jew, 
Nicholas, a Gentile convert to Judaism, who became a Jew, who then became a Christian. A different type of men. They were ordained or commended, if you wish, or appointed. You know, some people say, well, everybody's a deacon, or well, what makes it so special, this role, this responsibility? Well, the fact that one is chosen by one's peers based on specific qualifications and then approved by a leadership, that's what makes a role or a service separate or special. Deacons are a special and separate role from elders or preachers or saints by virtue of their qualifications, selection, and commendation. Somebody can come to the church building and mow the lawn. You know, we need some extra help, you know, the growing season, and they come and they mow the lawn. That doesn't make them a deacon. They're giving service and they're doing it from a good heart and because they're faithful men or women, you know, but if it's a man, I think I'll go help a Brother Virgil you know, and give him a hand. Well, that doesn't make him a deacon. What makes a person a deacon is that he's been selected and ordained by the elders. That's what makes him a deacon. So the second passage that mentions deacons and the first that actually refers to them as such is Philippians chapter 1 verse 1. Paul writes, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints, that's all the church, in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, he could have said to the church in Philippi, same thing, including the overseers, that's a special role, and the deacons, that's a special role. So you notice how he, he addresses everybody in the church, all the saints, men and women, everyone, young and old, those are the saints. And then he says, the overseers and the deacons. So there are not many references to deacons in the New Testament, but in the first two that we've looked at, we can conclude several things about them. Number one, they're men who are spiritually mature and they use their particular talents in special service to the church aside from the ministry of the word. Now the ministry or the service of the word is that of elders and preachers. The work of deacons permit elders and preachers to concentrate on their ministry. That's exactly what the apostles said. This is an important task. It needs to be done. There, you know, it, it, if it's not done properly, it could cause problems. However, we, the apostles, we haven't been called to this particular ministry. And so let's select men and appoint them, you know, to do, this, uh, to do this task. This doesn't mean that deacons can't teach or preach. We know very well that Stephen, the very first one that they mentioned, was very eloquent. However, they are chosen as deacons for the other services that they render. Another thing we know about them, they're selected by and from the congregation by the congregation, from the congregation, for service to the congregation, and they are commended and ordained by the leaders, the elders. Another thing we know about them, their leadership or authority is connected to the accomplishing of their task. They have charge over their ministry once it is defined by the elders. So if the elders here in this case, you seven are in charge of distributing the food among these hundreds of people, you have the charge, you're in charge of that. You're in charge of the groundskeeping. You're in charge of the maintenance of the building, uh, whatever. Another thing we know about them, no job, no deacon. No job, no deacon. There are no deacons without specific tasks. Since the word and context refers to the one who does a specific job, when there is no job, then there is no deacon. However, a deacon can be given charge over a small task and still be a deacon. I've been in churches where someone who is a deacon, his one task is he counts the money, he counts the, uh, the collection on Sunday. Very careful about it, making sure that everything is done properly and orderly and making sure that that money is counted, checks with checks, cash with cash, you know, all that kind of business in order to hand that over to 
uh, to the uh, bookkeeper and uh, the banks and so on and so forth. That's all he does. He's the deacon, he's responsible for that. What determines the office is the qualifications of the man, his choice and confirmation and the fact that he has a job to do. I mean, it's okay to have 20 deacons so long as you, they qualify and they have work to do. There's no deacon at large <laughs> or deacon in waiting. Deacons also have no group authority. They constitute no authority as individuals nor as a group within the church. I've seen that happen. One deacon by himself realizes his job is such and such, whatever it is, you know, setting up the tables and the chairs in the auditorium, and that's his job. And then all of a sudden, you know, because there are six or seven deacons in the church, they decide to have a meeting. And all of a sudden, thinking that at that meeting, these six deacons all together, they constitute some kind of authority. Well, they don't. It's a big problem with the uh, smaller churches that don't have elders and deacons. You have a men's meeting and sometimes they take on authority that the Bible doesn't give to them. It's always very difficult. So they constitute no authority as individual, nor as a group within the church. They are not a committee, nor a lobby group. They are servants with a specific task. Uh, the other thing that's uh, interesting is, um, if you want you know, more scripture to support this, in Acts chapter 15, when uh, the apostles and the elders and the missionaries, you know, Paul and Barnabas, when they get together to talk about the problem that was happening at Antioch, you know, uh, circumcision and all that business, you know, and, and it says that uh, different people got up to speak. Peter spoke and James spoke and the elders were there. And, and, and it says that this was a meeting that was discussing this problem, but you don't see there anyone says, and the deacons spoke up. No, they, they weren't part of that meeting. Okay. Again, not to disparage the role or those who work as deacons, but there are boundaries for their task and their authority you know, given to us in the Bible. And it's always good to be reminded of that. Um, another passage um, uh, is 1 Timothy chapter 3, 8 to 13. I'll read that in a minute. Now in Acts 6, 1 to 6 reveals the work and the spiritual maturity of these servants of the church and how they were selected. Philippians 1.1 confirms the fact that they were recognized as, uh, as a specific role within the church, apart from the elders and the preachers. 1 Timothy 3, however, gives us some insight as to the basic qualifications uh, necessary to be considered for the role, as well as their standing in the body and how they were chosen. So Paul has outlined the basic qualifications for elders in the Lord's church. And then he immediately follows this with the qualifications for deacons. He says in chapter three, verse eight, deacons likewise, I'm going to come back to that word likewise, deacons likewise must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain. So insofar as character, Deacons are to resemble elders, because he's talked about the qualification of elders, and then he says, and deacons likewise. Well, likewise to who? Well, likewise to the elders. You could say it in another way. Just as the elders, comma, deacons must, and so on and so forth. Okay. So the term must means that there is no question about the need to be strict in requiring these qualifications for this role. Must, it says. They have to have this. You can't compromise on these qualifications here. He says they should be men of dignity. Uh, some Bibles say grave signifies a man who is respected, not flippant, not coarse. Double tongue refers to one who is a hypocrite, insincere, person who talks behind other people's backs, causes trouble. Not given to much wine, uh, they say it in different ways in different Bibles, not given to much wine, some of them say sober, others, you know. Not a brawler. Moderation in the use of wine as it was consumed at that time. 
At that time it was a common drink, usually mixed with water for Jews anyways. Uh, very low alcohol content. Today we have wine, 12-13% alcohol. In those days the, yeah, the alcohol content was not high like that. Uh, moderate drinking would not produce drunkenness for these people. They were not moderate social drinkers. You know, we, we get this idea of social drinking. You know, I, I only drink at parties. Well, that, that wasn't the idea here. <laughs> they drank wine as their primary drink and had to be careful not to let it lead to drunkenness. I mean, that's, that's what it says there. They should not be fond of sordid gain. In the original context, uh, this expression meant a person who earned a living in a sordid or an unclean way. So what's a way to earn your living in an unclean Well, gambling, prostitution, stealing, cheating, any way which is shameful for a Christian. Also people who like this type of lift, living, you know, grifters. In verse 9 he goes on, he says, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. So the mystery of the faith, well that's the gospel. The way people were to be saved was a mystery that no one knew until Christ came and revealed it. That's why they call it the mystery. So men who are able to believe and practice their faith with a clear conscience. So clear conscience meaning, based on what he's just said, well, they're not undignified. They're not hypocritical. They're not drunkards. They're not impure. They're not greedy. They have a clear conscience. That's not me. Some believe the mystery, but they don't act like they believe it. So Paul is saying, you want deacons who, the true believers, they really do believe the gospel, and they really sincerely are trying to follow after what Jesus has taught. Verse 10, he says, these men must also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. So they're to, have a, they're to be proven that they're qualified before they're appointed. So the church will choose a man they see doing the work, or a work, living a good Christian life, long before he's appointed as a deacon. So 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 22 warns against being too quick in appointing elders or deacons, lest their failure, uh, the evangelists or the elders will have to, will have to bear. So it's easy to put somebody into service, quite another thing to take them out of service. And if, if you're responsible for appointing a deacon uh, and that person does something that divides the church, well part of the responsibility falls back on the individual that appointed them. So you, you know, we have to take our time before we do that. When Paul says also, he's saying that this period of testing is also required for the elders. You, you don't appoint an elder who says, you know what, when I become an elder, then I'm really going to start serving and I'm really going to start coming to church <laughs> on a regular basis. You know? So I think we know that. But. So men who aren't already providing leadership of some kind and service, that we, we don't recognize their holy lives, we're not sure about them, they should not be appointed as elders or, or deacons. Verse 11, he writes, women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. This verse has been used to suggest that women should also be appointed to be deaconesses in the church. The arguments for this are as follows. The term woman can mean wives, as in the wives of deacons, or it can mean women, as in deaconesses or servants of the church. That's one argument. Another argument is in Romans 16, 1, Paul commends Phoebe, obviously a woman, a servant, and some say, well, the term there should be deaconess. And then thirdly, there are some early writings that suggest that women did serve in this capacity in some churches at that time. The arguments counter to those are the following. First of all, Paul does not use the term deaconess here, but just a word that means wives or can be interpreted as women. Had he used the term deaconess, there would be no confusion, but he didn't use that term. Secondly, the context of this passage is a list of qualifications for men as deacons, and this reference to wives 
which seem natural as instructions to the wives of not only the deacons, but the elders as well. well they have to be married. That's part of the, you, know, you cannot be single and be an elder or a deacon. So they have to be married. Would it not seem you know, logical to provide some information about their wives? Because the wives are going to be involved with people and the work. And so their character and conduct had to be above reproach as well. So he lists the elders and the deacons and then the women or the wives of these men. Logical progression. And very important too because uh, if, you're, if you're an elder or deacon or a preacher you know, and your wife does not support you in that work, it's going to be a very long hard road. I've known some men when I was in college a long time ago who wanted to be preachers, missionaries, and they were taking courses, but their wives were not along for the ride. You know, one, one fellow that I knew, one brother that I knew told me, my wife said to me, I didn't sign up to be a missionary's wife because uh, he, was, uh, he was a computer guy you know, for years and then he decided, I want to go into missions, uh, you know, my heart for missions. And, and so he went back to school to get a degree, you know, and his wife told him, I, you know, I believe in God, but I, I, I don't think this is the life I want for us and our children, going off to another country. You know. And I think you know, he showed a wise decision where he finished his school, but he went back into the work of you know, computers and things like that and served the church very well you know, with the knowledge that he gained in college, but he never did leave the country to go be a missionary. Um, another thing, the only examples that we have of deacons doing the work shows men doing the work. In Acts 6, 1 to 6, sees the apostles specify men to be selected. Two opportunities here by two different apostles to establish women in this particular role, and both times, Peter and Paul specify men. Uh, so there's stronger evidence uh, for the role of deacon being uh, for men only. What we do see, however, in the New Testament are women serving. In other words, they're diakonosing, you know? they're serving, they're waitering in a variety of, in a variety of ways. For example, women supporting Jesus' ministry in Luke chapter eight. Women praying in the upper room, Acts chapter one. Dorcas making clothing for the poor, Acts chapter nine. Mary, the mother of Mark, you know, John Mark, Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark. Mary, the mother of Mark, offering her home as a meeting place for the apostles, Acts 12. Lydia offering hospitality to Paul and his companions in Acts 16. Priscilla uh, offering her house to Paul and along with her husband having a Bible study with Apollos, Acts 18. Phoebe, that woman, uh, going on a long trip in order to deliver a letter to Paul when he was in Rome, uh, Romans 16.1. So we have plenty of opportunities and plenty of examples in the New Testament showing women serving. They serve in many ways. The women therefore are not among the chosen by the church and set up before the leadership and appointed as deacons. On the other hand, there are many men who serve in a variety of ways at different times also, but not all of them are set forth as deacons as well. You know, not every man who serves is a deacon. The point here is that all Christians, men and women, serve. They all waiter. They take messages. They work on behalf of the body. Only some of the men who are qualified are chosen by the church and appointed by the elders to be responsible for certain tasks. Therefore, in the verse that we're considering, verse 11, I believe Paul refers to the wives of deacons. And he says that as wives of deacons, they also must be dignified, same thing as their husband. Not malicious gossips. I mean, it's never okay to be you know, a gossip, but a deacon's wife must especially have a handle on the problem since she, through her husband, is involved in many areas of the work and with many people in the church. Temperate, meaning sober, 
sober-minded, not easily carried away by emotions and arguments and strife. That's a big temptation for a preacher's wife, an elder's wife, because, or deacon's wife, because elders, preachers, and deacons are criticized publicly. When something goes wrong, we, we blame the ones in charge, don't we? The thing about the deacon or elder or preacher's wife is she doesn't like seeing her husband being criticized. And some of them fight back. So Paul is saying you know, we want them to be sober-minded. They, they, we want the wives to be in charge of their emotions. And faithful as a general rule. Faithful, of course, in the faith especially, but also in service, in marriage, in friendship. In other words, the deacon's wife, elder's wife, preacher's wife, uh, she's a trustworthy person. You can trust her. If someone confides in her, that person needs to be confident that that confidence there, that thing that was entrusted to her, stays with her. Verse 12, deacon, then he goes back, Deacons must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their own households. So same qualifications as elders, it starts anyways. That no matter what his marital status, first and only marriage or widower or divorced or polygamist in the past, now as a Christian he is a one woman man. He is exclusively faithful to his wife. It's his attitude Paul is referring to. Uh, in a very practical way, if I want to bring this to a modern setting. You know, the one woman man, we see that as awkward. How does that work today? Well, it works this way. Other women feel comfortable and confident around him. That's the kind of man he is. There's no question about his fidelity to his wife. He may be serving other women. He may be surrounded with other women. There may be women who work for him. But none of those women ever feel compromised in any way. Why? Because he's a one woman man. Because his eyes and his attention is for his wife and he does not give to anyone else what he only gives to his wife. That's why I kind of feel strongly about this, this idea. It so describes the, the attitude that a religious church leaders need to have when it comes to women and you know, their interactions with women. A man's home and family says a lot about the man uh, himself, of course. Um, let's see, he must also be a good manager in his home. If deacons can't manage and care for their families, you know, they're too busy or too lazy or too selfish or too immature, how are they going to be able to manage the affairs and the work of the church? Verse 13, he says, for those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So Paul mentions the reward for those deacons who do a good job in their role of servants in the church. And that is increased measure and confidence. Let me, there we go. The increased measure and confidence in their faith concerning Jesus. Serving well reaffirms one's faith and strengthens a person's confidence in salvation and God's care and the hope of heaven. Notice that the more you serve, the more you give, the more you sacrifice, the stronger your faith is. It's not the people that come to church once a month, never attend any of the activities, never visit, never serve, give you know, what's extra, it's never those people uh, who demonstrate strong faith that you're impressed by the way that they handle themselves spiritually, it's not those people. It's the people that are, you know, that are in the mix all the time, they're there. It's almost boring, they're always there. Every time you come, that brother is always there, he's always greeting, he's always here, he's, he's always there. But that type of faithfulness, that type of perseverance builds individual faith and strength and builds confidence in the people that you know, serve with him. Stronger faith produces peace of mind. Stronger faith produces a joyful heart. Stronger faith produces a greater intimacy 
with God. You know, what does the Hebrew writer say, right? He who comes to God must first what? Believe that He is and a rewarder of those uh, who diligently seek Him? If this is the type of reward that comes with service to God, imagine the blessings on deacons and their wives who are officially appointed to service the Lord's church. Um, there are many people who think, well, you know, you'll be a deacon and then you'll work your way up to elder. <laughs> Just that imagery is all wrong for the church. <laughs> yeah. It's not the way it works. Uh, serving as a deacon and serving well for many, many years is in itself its own reward. God blesses you for that type of work. Okay, so this ends the section on special servants in the church. Next time we're going to finish the chapter and see why Paul has written this letter in the first place. So some a little bit of thinking about deacons and elders there. We'll stop right there and we'll pick it up next time. Thank you for your attention.